Thank you for joining us for part two of our series, Biodiversity Applications for Airborne Imaging Systems. My name is Brittany Beaudry, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Juan Torres Perez, Sativa Cruz, Amber McCullum, and our guest speaker for today, Adam Wilson. For this training, we have four sessions, each being one and a half hours long. We started last Monday on March 27th, and today is our second session on March 29th, and our third session is next Monday, April 3rd, and our final session is next Wednesday, April 5th. You can find all of the course materials on the website listed here, and you can also email myself or my colleagues at the email addresses shown here for any questions. The two prerequisites for this training uh, include an understanding of the basics of remote sensing and hyperspectral data for land and coastal systems. We have our courses on those concepts listed here. For this series, we will have one homework assignment and the link to the homework will be made available during the last session and will be due on Wednesday, April 19th. The homework will be a Google form that you submit online. If you attend all the sessions and complete the homework by the deadline, you will receive a certificate of completion, but please be patient as it takes a couple months to process and send out these certificates. As I mentioned, this series will consist of four sessions, and during the first session we provided a general overview of hyperspectral visible shortwave infrared data. In today's session, we will understand how airborne campaigns capture and use LIDAR and thermal infrared data. And for the subsequent sessions, we will give specific case study examples of using airborne campaigns for terrestrial and aquatic systems. I'll quickly review the learning objectives of the course here. So by the end of this training, attendees will be able to understand the applications of hyperspectral data, multispectral data, and LIDAR data for biodiversity monitoring and analysis, compare case studies that have, been, that have used these data sets in preparation for upcoming NASA satellite missions and airborne campaigns, and after the lecture portion of the session, we will have time for a question and answer portion so please feel free to type your questions into the questions tab along the way, and we will try to get to as many as possible at the end. We will also post the questions and answers on our website after the training. So if we don't get to a question, you can also email me or my colleagues at our email addresses listed in one of the previous slides. Okay, so let's start by reviewing some airborne instruments that measure hyperspectral visible shortwave infrared data that we discussed in part one. In the first session, we mentioned the Avarice NG spectrometer. Avarice stands for Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer and NG stands for Next Generation. Avarice NG is an airborne program that captures data in the visible shortwave infrared spectrum. Avarice Next Generation has been around since 2009 and has flown throughout North America, Europe, and India. The image on the right shows the locations of its deployment throughout Europe in a 2021 campaign. Avarice NG has 481 continuous spectral bands. It has the spectral coverage from 380 to 2510 nanometers with a 5 nanometer spectral resolution. They have a spatial resolution of two to six meters, depending on the altitude of the plane during flight. And data from Avaris NG result in level 1B and 2 products that can be downloaded from their data portal online. And the image on the bottom right is of an image cube that was captured by Avaris NG. So another visible shortwave infrared spectrometer we discussed in our first session was PRISM. PRISM stands for Portable Remote Imaging Spectrometer and has been active since 2012. It is flown throughout the Western United States, South America, and the Southern Ocean. It, was, it has 256 continuous spectral bands uh, over 350 to 1,050 nanometers and has 50 shortwave infrared bands at 1,240 and 1,610 nanometers. 
data from PRISM result in level 1B and 2 products that can be downloaded from their data portal online. The image on the left is an example of how PRISM can be used to monitor water quality in the San Francisco Bay Delta estuary. Moving on to the new material we'll cover today, we will start with an, ex uh, with an overview of thermal and LIDAR data for characterizing the structure and function of ecosystems using airborne campaigns. And then we will highlight uh, thermal and LIDAR missions, such as the hyperspectral, or, yeah, hyperspectral thermal emission spectrometer, known as HITES, and NASA's land, vegetation, and ice sensor, known as ELVIS. Then Adam Wilson will highlight uh, the upcoming NASA biodiversity field campaign in the Greater Cape Floristic Region of South Africa. We will then wrap up this session with some questions and answers. And again, feel free to type your questions into the questions tab throughout our presentation, and we will try to get to as many as possible at the end. And we will also post the training questions and answers on our website after the training. All right, so let's start with an overview of thermal and LIDAR data. To briefly define LIDAR, LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging and is another form of observational remote sensing. With LIDAR, a laser is used to measure the ranges, meaning the distances between the sensor and how long it takes the reflectance of the laser to return to the sensor. LiDAR data is typically measured through airborne campaigns and is known for its precision and its accuracy. The image on the upper left shows the transit beam from an aircraft, aircraft equipped with a LiDAR sensor. The image on the bottom left shows how a laser pulse from that transit beam can measure the range between objects on the ground and the sensor in the aircraft. The black and white image on the right shows a top-down and a side view of Loggerhead Key Lighthouse in Florida taken with a LiDAR sensor. Here you can see how detailed LiDAR can be and how it can be used to create 3D models and digital elevation models, which are typically referred to as DEMs. And here are some examples of how we can use LiDAR data to capture changes in elevation and create 3D models and DEMs. The GIF on the left shows Elvis data from an airport in Costa Rica layered in 3D. The lower data set is a hillshade version of the data. The middle layer is the ground elevation and the top is the surface or top elevation. The image on the right shows Elvis elevation measurements over sea ice in the Arctic. Data is colored by elevation and is plotted on top of color imagery taken at the same time. Both images show how LiDAR data can capture precise intricacies within data that may otherwise have been lost without the inclusion of elevation in one's measurements. So thermal infrared is typically described as the spectral range between 8,000 and 15,000 nanometers in the electromagnetic spectrum. Infrared is invisible to the human eye, but we can detect it as heat. And studying the Earth using thermal infrared allows us uh, better detection of several environmental variables that we cannot study just within the visible spectrum. So thermal infrared sensors have been used in many airborne campaigns to measure how temperature varies within the structure and function of our environment. On the left is a thermal map of the California Central Valley taken with NASA's HITES at 65,000 feet. The bottom images show how thermal infrared spectrometers like HITES can be used to monitor methane plumes. This is an example of methane leaking from an underground gas storage facility outside Los Angeles, California in 2015. And on the right, uh, thermal infrared data is being used to improve how urban methane emissions are detected. The image on the left shows a persistent methane hotspot over Los Angeles from September 2011 through October 2013, and the two vertical images show how individual methane leaks from an oil field in 2014. Now that we've reviewed LIDAR and thermal infrared, let's examine some NASA sensors that have been deployed for airborne campaigns. In this diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum, we can see the sensors we, reviewed in, uh, we reviewed in the previous session, Avaris NG and PRISM, along with their spectral range. 
In addition to Adverse NG and PRISM, we will also be looking at HITES today, which, as you can see, covers a different portion of the spectrum, which is the thermal infrared section. So this is our first sensor, and this is HITES, and HITES stands for Hyperspectral Thermal uh, Emission Spectrometer, and it is a thermal infrared sensor. Its objective is to provide precursor high spectral and spatial resolution thermal infrared data to determine the optimum band positions for the thermal red, in thermal red instrument on HISPERI, which is a future satellite mission. HITES has flown on Twin Otter and ER-2 aircraft in the United States and Europe, and HITES has been active since 2012 and is still active today. The top left image is of the HITES logo, uh, and the top right image is of the HITES uh, instrument which was recording data in Sweden in 2021. And then the bottom right image is a diagram of the HITES instrument. And then the lower left image is of the instrument on board a twin otter aircraft. Looking at the specifications of HITES, it has 256 spectral bands. It has a spectral range from 7.5 to 12 micrometers. It has a spectral resolution of 4.5 micrometers, and the spatial resolution of all airborne sensors depends on the altitude and the speed of the aircraft during recording, but typically HITES has a resolution of 3.41 meters at 2,000 meters above ground level and 34.13 meters at 2,000 meters above ground level. So the image on the left shows a vertical slice of a HITES image cube and the data variations within all 256 spectral bands. So the products that HITES produces vary from level 1.8 to level 3, and the top image on the left shows level 1 brightness temperature. The photo in the middle shows level 2 surface temperature along with the color bar, and then the image on the top right shows level two emissivity. The bottom image uh, shows three products with methane highlighted in green all the way to the left, followed by hydrogen sulfide in purple, ammonia in red in the middle, sulfur dioxide in blue, and nitrogen dioxide in orange all the way on the right. You can access and use HITES data by navigating to the sensor's website. Here, you can order and download data directly, and data is automatically sorted by most recent date, but you can filter by month and year, and you can read the campaign summaries to narrow down your search. The image on the bottom is of the data order page on HITES's website. When you do download HITES data, it comes in a variety of data types. Luckily, HITES has a section on its website that provides file description and naming information for the various files, along with a user guide and a tutorial for creating a geographic lookup table in NV. HITES is busy with deployments, which have recently included the Western Diversity Time Series campaign in August and September, and the G5 checkout campaign in November. HITES has deployments planned through the rest of 2023, which include a European campaign mid-April through May and a Bioscape campaign mid-October through November. The image on top shows the HITES control system in a hangar as it waits to be installed for a flight. And the image on the bottom is of a NASA ER-2 high-altitude aircraft with the Avaris and HITES instruments installed. Now we'll look at a few case studies that highlight the biodiversity applications of HITES data. This slide shows various instances in which HITES was used to monitor greenhouse gas emissions. The image on the top left shows surface temperature and ammonia over a cattle feedlot in Kern County near Bakersfield, California. The image on the right shows surface temperature and ammonia over the power plant facility in the city of El Segundo, located in Los Angeles County, California. The image on the bottom shows high tes retrievals of the surface temperature and ammonia enhancements over the gulch fire in northern Arizona. 
the left image is the retrieved surface temperature and the right figure shows retrieved ammonia plumes originating from the fire. The next case study for HITES highlights how canopy emissivity and land and water surface temperature can be monitored with HITES. The images on the left show HITES imagery at two meter resolution from 2014 on July 5th, showing emissivity on the left and land surface temperature in the middle. Emissivity is displayed, uh, displayed with bands uh, 10.1 micrometers is red, 9.2 micrometers is green, and 8.5 micrometers is blue. The right panel shows high spatial resolution RGB imagery of the Huntington Garden study area in San Marino, California. The graph on the right shows 2014 and 2016 canopy land surface temperature distributions for 24 plant species within the botanical garden. Circles are medium land surface temperatures, with the top and bottom of bars marking the 25th and 75th quartiles. Asterisks designate significant differences between the 2014 and the 2016 land surface temperature distributions. All right, so the next sensor we'll discuss today is ELVIS. ELVIS stands for Land Vegetation and Ice Sensor and is a LIDAR sensor. Its objective is to provide elevation and surface structure measurements. Elvis has flown on 12 different types of aircraft, and it has flown in the Arctic, including Greenland, Alaska, and Canada, the Antarctic, and the continental United States, as well as Africa and Costa Rica, and it has been active since 1998. The image on the right is elevation data collected by Elvis over the Crane Glacier in the Antarctic Peninsula. Blue colors represent lower elevation, and red colors represent higher elevation. All right, so here are some specifications for Elvis. It has a 1,064 nanometer laser and three detectors and operates at altitudes up to 20 kilometers. It has a scan angle of about 12 degrees and can cover two kilometer swaths of surface from an altitude of 10 kilometers. The image on the right shows the Elvis scan and beam pattern. The unique Elvis scanning system generates this pattern that evenly and completely samples the surface below. There are approximately 100 beams across the two kilometer wide swath, and the colors here represent the surface elevation, with blue is low and then the yellow white colors are high. The slight undulations at the top and bottom edges are a result of the aircraft roll. On to its data products. Elvis data include level 1A, level 1B, and level 2A products. The level 1B files contain the geolocated laser waveform data for each laser footprint. The level 2A data files contain canopy top and ground elevations and relative heights derived from the level 1 data. The image on the left is an overview of Elvis data products. These products rely on information contained in the geolocated geo laser return waveform, which is again, the 1B product. Locations of several modes and reflecting points are extracted using single processing methods and then geolocated using the information in the level 1B file and the output in the level 2 files. These include elevations from the center and lowest and highest modes in the waveform, as well as the highest detected return, for example, a canopy top. You can access and use Elvis data by navigating to the data locations area on the sensor's website. You can start by selecting the area of data you want, and from there, you can select data based on platform, year, or the campaign. The image on the left is of the data page on Elvis's website. Oh, I'm sorry, the image on the right. When you do download Elvis data, it comes in a variety of data types listed. There are guides for the variety of data and the data types, as well as tutorials and a frequently asked questions section all available on the website itself. Elvis has flown in several regions around the world, as listed here. 
And then the image on the left is of some North American flights, which is available for uh, all data locations. And you can view when you access the data portal on the Elvis website. The chart on the right is of all the various aircrafts that Elvis has flown with, which you can see is quite extensive. Elvis has deployments planned through the rest of 2023, which include a Bioscape campaign late October through December. And the image on the left shows the Elvis deployment schedule, which you can monitor on the front page of the Elvis website. Uh, now we'll look at a few case studies that highlight the biodiversity applications of Elvis data. This slide shows how LIDAR can be used to monitor forest structure. This project conducted by AFRISAR studied the rainforest canopy in Gabon, home to some of the tallest mangrove forests on earth. The images on the left show Elvis gridded data products for Monda, which is an area in Northwest Gabon at 30 meter resolution. They are from top to bottom, gridded di di digital elevation models, relative height metrics, and a plant area index composite of zero meters to 10 meters in red, 10 to 20 meters in green, 20 to 30 meters in blue, and a plant area index between zero and 10 meters vertical, a plant area index between 20 and 30 meters vertical, and canopy cover fraction. And the images on the right show gridded Elvis instrument data products at 25 meter spatial resolution over the Monda forest on the left and Mabuni on right sites that are also within Gabon. Elvis has been used to study the topography of ice sheets and assist with satellite missions. Here, Operation Ice Bridge has studied changes in polar ice, such as the thickness of sea ice, glaciers, and ice sheets, to better understand the connections between polar regions and the global climate system. Ice Bridge's goal is to bridge the gap between the ICESAT missions. Elvis has assisted Ice Bridge by providing elevation data with a, uh, within a GLAS, the Geoscience Laser Altimeter System, on board ISAT. In its footprint. The image on the top left shows the terminus of a glacier in northeast Greenland in August 2017 during an Operation Ice Bridge flight. The diagrams on the top show the digital elevation model interpolation within the GLAS footprint. The image on the left shows the original Elvis elevation distribution within the footprint itself with the white pixels representing the footprint shape. And the image on the right shows the Elvis DEM interpolation within the footprint. And the image on the bottom right shows the Elvis data over the Antarctic Peninsula draped onto a Google Earth background. The elevations have been converted to slopes to highlight the dunes in the area. I also want to mention another sensor, which is the Goddard's LiDAR hyperspectral and thermal imager, typically referred to as G-Light. Its objective is to provide simultaneous measurements of veg vegetation structure, foliar spectra, and surface temperature at very high spatial resolution on a wide range of airborne platforms. G-Light has been flown in US and Mexico and has a Cessna, Piper, Twin Otter, and VDC aircraft compatibility. It has also been active since 2011. The image on the right shows some of GLight's data products, starting with a true color image, a canopy height model, a photochemical reflectance index in the middle, a normalized difference vegetation index, and temperature on the very far right. Here are GLight specifications from their version two, which covers all data collected after 2017. G-Lite has a LiDAR sensor, two VNIR sensors, a thermal sensor, and a high resolution lens. Version one data from 2011 to 2016 is still available as well, but some of these specifications are different as they use different sensors at this time. And here are some of the product levels available from G-Lite, which span from level one to level three. And the instrument on the far left are from 
GLite version 1, but these data product levels are the same for the version 2 data as well. For accessing and using GLite data, um, you can navigate to the data center web map on the sensors website, and you can look up data by year, location, campaign, and even more. And the image on the right is of the data's web page. You can also download data from the Land Processes Distributed Active Archive Center, also known as the LPDAC. And when you do download GLite data, it comes in a variety of data types which are listed here. The GLite website has links and instructions for various software tools compatible with all the various kinds of GLite data. And the LPDAC has a frequently asked questions page for the data and working with its various data types. To wrap up our section on the different sensors we discussed today, we have a quick comparison of their specifications. We can see the differences and how long each has been active, as well as their spectral range, spectral cover, spectral coverage, spectral resolution, and their spatial resolution. This information for GLI is a bit different as it has several sensors. We also have comparison of the access and use between the sensors. Here we can see the different years of data we currently have access to, as well as data product levels and the data types. For many airborne campaigns, their data is available for download on their respective data portals. But I also want to mention that NASA has several distributed active archive centers, commonly referred to as DACs, that host these data as well. Typically, the campaign dictates which DAC the data is held at. So for example, an airborne campaign over an Arctic region will host data at the National Snow and Ice Center. These archive centers also host their own tutorials and guides for the sensors we mentioned today. So I highly recommend you use them as an additional resource when you work with these data. At this time, I'll pass it off to Adam Wilson, who's here to highlight the upcoming NASA Biodiversity Field Campaign in the Greater Cape Floristic Region of South Africa. Hello, and thank you for your interest in this course. My name is Adam Wilson. I'm an Associate Professor of Geography, Environment, and Sustainability at the University at Buffalo in New York State. And I'm thrilled to be here today to introduce the biodiversity survey of the Cape as a case study of the Airborne uh, Biodiversity Applications course. First, I want to take a step back and reflect on what an exciting time it is to be able to bring together all of the instruments uh, that you just learned about, including imaging, spectroscopy, and LIDAR, and apply them to the challenges that we face in biodiversity conservation and, and maintaining uh, ecosystem function and services on the planet. As I'm sure you're aware, uh, we're, we're in a phase of uh, increasing human development pressure as human population and uh, needs increase. And that has led to what appears to be the sixth mass extinction and, and loss of biodiversity on the planet, which has a number of, of uh, implications including loss of ecosystem services to people that we actually depend on. And so um, I would argue that, that now is an incredibly uh, important time that we apply all of the tools that we have to understanding uh, biodiversity and how it contributes to ecosystem functions and services. And one of the ways that we can do that is through airborne campaigns. So the idea of a campaign is to bring together the sensors that you just learned about together with uh, field observations. And so that's really the critical part of, the, um, of this, this idea of a campaign because the airborne data on its own is useful, um, but we really can only get the, the, the full value out of it when it's combined with the kinds of observations that we can only make on the ground or in the water uh, to, to really uh, identify and map out uh, the variation of, of species on the earth, the various functional traits and um, functions that 
uh, that ecosystem is performing uh, on the on the surface of Earth. And so to uh, integrate these these observations together um, requires a lot of coordination and bringing together both the instruments up in the air, both on aircraft and uh, spaceborne, whether it's on the, the International Space Station or a satellite, together with observations on the ground. And the reason this is needed is that the remote uh, the remote sensing um, sensors can only see so much, right? They're, they're all measuring um, how photons interact or are emitted from the surface of the Earth. And so there's, there's no way that they're ever going to capture things like genetic variability, um, phylogenetic relationships between species, things like that, that um, can only be sort of directly measured, uh, quantified using other kinds of tools. But if we're doing that kind of, of field-based study, at the same time in the same place that the airborne imagery is being collected, then um, we can combine those two kinds of observations to better understand and ultimately work towards the, the preservation of Earth's biodiversity. So Bioscape is the biodiversity survey of the Cape, and we've opted to focus this campaign on a really unique part of Earth known as the Greater Cape Floristic Region, which you can see here is in the, the very southwestern corner of the continent of Africa. And this region was selected because it harbors really incredible biodiversity. There are seven terrestrial biomes and four marine bioregions, uh, numerous uh, really unique freshwater systems. And all told, it, it uh, only covers about 1% of the African continent but harbors about 20% of plant species on the entire continent exists down in this one little corner of, of the continent. And about two thirds of those are endemic, meaning that they exist nowhere else. It also has a really high marine endemism and a number of other things uh, about it make it just a really fascinating place to do a study like this. And it's also quite different from the kind of ecosystem where much of of the studies and examples that you just learned about have been applied. This is a, a relatively arid shrubland uh, system on land. And then in the, the marine systems, it's where the Atlantic and Indian Ocean come together, which is what leads to that, that really high marine endemism is because it's these two uh, oceans coming together and, and mixing right, right off the tip of the African continent. And overlaid on that, biological, um, uh, that, that biological hotspot, um, which you can see here in the upper left is a map of vascular plant species richness. And so not surprisingly, you can see that the tropical forests of the world have fairly high species richness, um, but you can really see how this, this corner of South Africa here um, has species diversity that rivals uh, terrestrial um, tropical forests but is in fact, as I mentioned before, a relatively arid shrubland. So that alone makes it just a really fascinating case study on, on the extent to which these new tools uh, can be used to understand spatial variability of biodiversity. We can also see here in the lower left um, that it's also an extinction hotspot where the second most uh, recorded plant species extinction since 1900. Um, and, and part of that is due to the challenges of addressing um, the needs of, of human sustainable development with conservation and maintenance of, of ecosystem function and, and services. And you can see here on the right um, that this, this area and all of South Africa have, have a really complex history uh, that includes um, uh, both colonialism and a very racist governance structure leading to what is currently the most unequal country. Uh, and so as we you know, move into this new century and move towards trying to improve the sustainable development and uh, equity globally, um, overlaid on top of rapid environmental change and biodiversity loss really highlights, I think, this area as essentially a microcosm of the global challenges that we face. And so because it's such a small area that, that has all of these big challenges, I think it's a, an excellent place to test our abilities uh, at, at using these new tools and applying them to understand these critical ecosystem functions and services. 
So the key science themes for Bioscape are listed here and include the uh, distribution and abundance of biodiversity. So this is largely a mapping exercise, learning to what extent we can use these sensors to understand and quantify the spatial and temporal variation in where different species exist. And second is to understand the role of that diversity in ecosystem functions. So how do the species present at any location contribute to the overall functioning of that system and the, the downstream services that are provided to people and, and other ecosystems? And then finally, getting at the feedbacks between a global environmental change change in that biodiversity, so which species are where, and again, those ecosystem services. And you can see that summarized on the right, where is biodiversity, what is it doing, and why does it matter? So Bioscape is an airborne campaign, and we're gonna be bringing four of the instruments that you just learned about, the Elvis laser altimeter, HITES, PRISM, in Abrus NG, and those are going to be aboard two NASA aircraft, the Gulfstream 3 and the Gulfstream 5, and th they will be uh, flying around the region this October and November, collecting the, the imagery that, that you just learned about uh, in combination with a really rich set of field observations. And so on the ground, while the, the planes are in the, in the sky, uh, we'll have teams recording things like uh, phytoplankton functional types. So that's taking water samples, filtering out those phytoplankton, and then identifying uh, their, their, putting them in functional groups. There will be teams on land looking at plant functional trait and composition. So measuring various aspects of uh, plants like leaf size, leaf thickness, and also which species are present in which locations across the landscape. Uh, some teams will be doing more uh, functional measures like leaf and canopy reflectance that will be useful to compare those field observations to the imagery that was collected from above. And it's not just plants. We do have a, a focus on, on plants both on land and in water, but we also have some groups under the Bioscape umbrella looking at uh, bird distributions, frog distributions, insects, and so on. And we have one group uh, looking at environmental DNA, which is a really exciting, relatively new technology uh, that can be used to take a sample of the environment, which could be soil or water typically, and isolating the genetic fragments in that sample and using that to estimate the overall variation of, of life generally, um, not just plants and animals, but all life um, that, that have fragments that are contained in that sample. There will also be a team uh, taking terrestrial LIDAR. So that's similar to the kinds of imagery you learned about that could be measured from above, but just measured uh, on the ground or in the um, potentially in the water um, to record the three-dimensional structure of ecosystems. And so here on the top, you see the different kinds of remotely sensed observations, including the instruments you just learned about, as well as a suite of satellite observations that when combined with these field observations can be used to generate data products shown here. So things like functional diversity, uh, which is the variation of the uh, underlying physical function. So things like uh, carbon sequestration, uh, nutrient cycling, that sort of thing, with taxonomic diversity, estimates of how much uh, like species richness, how many species live in an area, Phylogenetic diversity is related to taxonomic diversity, but with a stronger focus on how related in evolutionary terms species are. And spectral diversity is basically taking the, the imagery and looking at the spatial variability of the spectral reflectance and using that as a proxy for underlying biological variability. And then with these products, um, we can get back at those high level questions about how does biodiversity contribute to ecosystem function and the contribution of nature to people? How can we use these tools to measure and monitor change in biodiversity? So if a species enters the, the community or a species leaves the community, um, how does that impact function? And then important in this region, which is a fire prone ecosystem, uh, similar to say the, Chap the chaparral of California, how does biodiversity contribute to um, resilience and recovery following disturbance? 
And so in Bioscape, we're bringing all of these different kinds of observations on the field and from above together in the same place at the same time. And that's really the power of an, of a, of an airborne campaign is that, that uniting or integration of these different data types. And so now what I'm going to do is just do a very high level brief overview of the different uh, components of the Bioscape project. So you can think of Bioscape as a, an umbrella project and then under the umbrella are um, a little over a dozen um, projects that are looking at different aspects of, of this, this broader question. So we have a couple of teams that are using radiative transfer models, which are physics-based models that estimate how um, light or radiation interacts with, in this case, ecosystems, which is useful for simulating how a, a particular ecosystem type would look from above. So it allows you to simulate that process of photons coming from the sun, uh, bouncing off of leaves, and then returning to the air and being measured by a sensor. Uh, it, it allows us to approximate that using well understood physical principles. And so this is a, a great way to do a reality check essentially on whether or not we understand what's happening on, the, on a pure physical level uh, with these instruments. There are also going to be teams looking at mapping those different aspects of diversity that I mentioned before, uh, uh, mostly focused on plants here, but not exclusively using the, the different kinds of imagery to approximate and see to what extent they are useful for measuring things like taxonomic diversity, phylogenetic diversity, and so on. So there has been quite a bit of work on this globally, but as I mentioned before, has been primarily focused in um, temperate and tropical forests. And so here we're applying it to a totally different kind of ecosystem in a different part of, of Earth. And we'll also be developing new data products that are directly useful for decision making, which NASA refers to as, as applications. Uh, so a few examples of that include using the imaging spectroscopy to identify invasive plant species that have um, entered the landscape. And so I didn't mention this before, but one of the uh, primary threats to uh, conservation of biodiversity in the region are a number of plant species from other parts of the planet, mostly Australia, some from Europe, um, that are uh, out competing the native species and can result in a drastic reduction of uh, species richness in a location that's been invaded and also change some of the fundamental ecosystem functions. So many of the non-native plants have higher rates of evapotranspiration. And so you end up losing more fresh water, which has implications for freshwater supply uh, for the people of the region as well. And so if we can use imaging spectroscopy to develop better maps and also monitor change through time, that is a really powerful tool for keeping track of, of which areas have been invaded and prioritizing limited resources to uh, uh, combat the spread of, of these species. And so um, imaging spectroscopy is, is likely to be a really useful tool that has not yet been systematically applied across, across the region for this question. And because the, the tools, the, the sensors are, are good at estimating things like evapotranspiration, primary productivity, we can also map the influence of invasive plants on directly on that evapotranspiration, for example, to see how uh, changing community composition, changing uh, which species are in a particular place leads to changes in um, the hydrologic cycle. We'll also be looking at uh, the effects of fire and post-fire recovery and use this imagery across space to get an idea of how the ecosystem recovers following disturbance, following fire, uh, and how that is influenced by things like soil, topography, um, and the, the pre-fire biodiversity uh, as well. So we can look at how biodiversity factors into post-fire recovery. A couple of other examples, uh, looking at groundwater dependent communities. So as I mentioned before, this is a fairly arid region. You can see that here in the photo. And so identifying areas that are dependent on access to groundwater can help explain why certain species are in, in some places and not others. And we think that we'll actually be able to identify and map out those uh, groundwater dependent plant communities. 
And finally, I want to um, just give a, a brief list of uh, some of the new methods that we're bringing to this, this project, including environmental DNA, which I mentioned before, um, which this, this group is going to be taking water samples and I think some soil samples uh, across the domain and then relating those to species composition in the area as measured on the, on the ground, um, but also uh, from above using the imaging spectroscopy and LIDAR measurements with the idea of being essentially to test to what extent is eDNA a useful proxy for variability in species richness um, and biodiversity across space. And you'll hear from uh, this team in a bit in, in later in this course. Uh, there's another group that's using sound, recording sound, uh, also known as the soundscape, to get a, a perspective on um, animal life that is difficult otherwise to observe. So these are things like bird calls, frog calls, and so the advantage of putting out a microphone, um, an autonomous recording microphone, is that it can record sound for days on end and then later be processed either into uh, measures of acoustic diversity, which don't depend on identifying you know, how many species of, of birds or insects there are, um, but instead just captures the overall variability of sound in a location or potentially uh, these recordings could be used to try to identify um, individuals either to species or, or other taxonomic group. And so those microphones will be deployed across the landscape as well and later um, integrated with the airborne observations. And then there's another group that's looking at uh, leaf level reflectance. So essentially taking a, a spectrometer and recording the um, reflectance for an individual leaf, not for a community as we've mostly been talking about in this course, but using that leaf level reflectance to investigate the evolutionary relationships between species. And so the basic idea here is that species that are uh, phylogenetically or evolutionarily more related would likely share um, uh, the share the, the their leaf reflectance would look similar, right? Their reflectance would be more similar if they're more closely related. And so by looking at how that variation um, uh, presents itself over, over a, a different branches of the phylogenetic tree, you can get an idea of how related different individuals are and use that to understand these long-term evolutionary processes. And now I want to take a, a step back and talk more broadly about the project and how we designed from the very beginning of this project uh, to broaden our metrics, metrics of success beyond just uh, traditional scientific outcomes like papers, academic papers, uh, to include things like uh, more equitable science. So from the very beginning, we've been discussing with um, both the US and South African side how we can avoid parachute science. So parachute science is when you have scientists coming in from outside somewhere, could be a different country um, or even just a different region, coming into a place and doing some sort of science and then going home and writing the papers without much interaction with the people that are um, either other scientists that are already engaged in that location or non-scientists that are, you know, it's their home that they're living in. Uh, and so from the very beginning, we've we've strived to build a very um, uh, collaborative culture in this project. Um, and we've developed a science team that is about 50% from the US and about 50% from South Africa and have been doing lots of, of international uh, meetings, workshops and developed uh, co-funding as well for, for the various projects in Bioscape. We also work to develop the course that you're in right now, which is the uh, the RSET uh, uh, Airborne Remote Sensing course. Um, and, and this is a part of this project to enable uh, practitioners in particular to learn more about these sensors and how they're being applied in Bioscape. And then we're also working on developing a, a short film about the Bioscape project, which will be available probably in late 2024 that describes all of the work that was done and the most exciting research findings. And we're also working with um, local um, science and, and environmental research groups 
to uh, do science education in the schools around it because we want to get kids involved in this as well. And so you, if you're interested in any of this, you can learn more at bioscape.io. Um, and lastly, I want to just give you a transition to what's coming up in the next couple of sessions here. So we have members of the Bioscape team who are going to be giving much more detailed uh, examples and overviews of how they've used these particular data sets that you've been learning about to answer some of the questions that they have. And so my, my presentation here was very much a high level overview. Uh, but but the next few guest speakers will be going into much greater detail of how these data are actually used um, in in this kind of study. And with that, I'd like to say thank you for your attention so far, and I look forward to chatting in person. Thank you, Adam, for providing us with that highlight. To summarize today's session. Uh, light detection and ranging, known as LIDAR, is a form of remote sensing that uses a laser, laser to measure distance. Thermal infrared is the spectral range of 8 to 15 micrometers in the electromagnetic spectrum. We can use data from the spectral range to monitor various environmental parameters. And lastly, NASA's hyperspectral thermal emission spectrometer, known as HITES, Goddard's LIDAR, hyperspectral, and thermal imager, known as G-Light, and land, vegetation, and ice sensor, known as ELVIS, are airborne campaigns that provide us with thermal and LIDAR data. Here we have a few resources related to the subjects we discussed in the session today. I encourage you all to use them to learn more about these topics. Thank you for joining us today and do come back on Monday for our third session on biodiversity applications for airborne imaging systems. We will now go into our question and answer portion and if you have further questions you can contact myself or my RSEC colleagues at our email addresses listed here. As a reminder here is the course website where you can find all the materials including the PowerPoint presentation and video. The homework link will be available on the course website during the final session. And I have also included our primary RSET website where you can check out all the other great trainings. Thank you again, and we will now begin the question and answer portion of the session. All right, so throughout the training today, um, we have been compiling the questions added to the questions tab, and we've been attempting to answer them right here. Uh, I'm joined today by various organizers and panelists for this training series, and uh, we've been trying to answer them to the best of our ability as they come in. So we'll go through some of the questions now, but if we don't get through all of the questions we have here, we will also post this Q&A document on the training website within a few days. All right, so let's start with question one. Uh, how were the different gases differentiated from the image? So I believe that this question is referring to slide 23 where researchers from the study that we were discussing used HITES to quantify ammonia emissions. So in these images, they use the thermal infrared abilities of HITES to monitor surface temperature and the concentration of ammonia. So ammonia and other greenhouse gases have specific spectral features that the thermal infrared sensors can detect. So in the images on that slide, the ammonia concentrations are measured in parts per billion and the dark blue colors are lower concentrations, while the red colors indicate higher concentrations. If you want to learn a little bit more about that study, I encourage you to read the link uh, when it's posted. I don't know if any of our other uh, panelists have anything else they'd like to add here. OK, so I can jump into question two. Uh, is HITES data only available for the United States and Europe? Uh, so far, HITES data is available for some sites in the continental United States, Hawaii, and the United Kingdom. And then here is the site linked where past missions have been flown. 
keep in mind that uh, HITES is flown based on missions that sign up to fly with HITES, so there could be additional locations in the future um, outside of the United States and Europe. I believe one of the slides shows some of their future uh, missions, so be sure to keep up with them to see where they fly uh, soon. All right, so for question three, can Elvis be used in near shore bathymetric mapping? Uh, so the best LIDAR for measuring bathymetry is bathymetric LIDAR, which uses the green web wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum, typically 200 and, or 532 nanometers, and it penetrates the water column for you know, measuring that bathymetry. Since Elvis describes itself as a topographic uh, LIDAR, it uses a 1064 nanometer laser and it typically does surface elevation for its own measurements. Um, so I would probably suggest a bathymetric LIDAR rather than Elvis if that's something that you're looking into. But if anyone else, any panelists have anything they'd like to add, I'll Give them the floor here. Okay. Brittany, that's exactly correct. Hi, Brittany. This is Leanne Gobb from NASA Ames. That is exactly correct. You need to have a, a different LIDAR system that, that has different sensitivity for doing aquatics. Great. Thank you, Leanne. All right, uh, question four, how close to true ground can a LIDAR sensor like Elvis detect in thick grasses? So I think this is just a question about uh, the accuracy of LIDAR and specifically Elvis. I don't have that open in front of me right now and I don't know if anyone else does. However, we can certainly answer that and put this answer to the question up when we post it in a couple of days. Um, I know on Elvis's website, it says it's highly accurate. I think it's maybe decimeter level, um, but I will get that exact information for you later. Okay, so for question five, is there a hyperspectral sensor covering the region of Africa? All right, so it looks like someone added a couple different links. I don't know if they want to introduce themselves and explain what they've included here. Um, please feel free to do so. I can I can cover that briefly. This is Adam Wilson. Um, so so spaceborne hyperspectral or imaging spectroscopy is a relatively new thing. So there's several sensors up, the links there um, that have gone up fairly recently. Other than Hyperion, it's just been in the past few years. Uh, and so there's not a full global coverage that, that goes back very far. Hyperion's been up longer. Um, the, the data quality is not as good, and even it does not have complete global coverage. But those would be the best places to start. But I will mention that the SBG, the NASA SBG mission, which is moving forward, will eventually, years from now, be be providing uh, global complete coverage with imaging spectroscopy. All right, great, thank you. Uh, for question six, uh, are the sensors information only available in Central and North America? If I wanted to obtain information from South America, for example, Colombia, what portal could I implement? So this is just another question about where exactly uh, different airborne campaigns have covered and if uh, Colombia is among those areas. Um, I know so far we've only talked about a couple different airborne campaigns. Um, I'm sure there's more out there that might have covered Columbia. That's something we'll have to get back to you about, unless anyone knows any right now. Personally, I do not. I can add to that briefly. This is Adam again. So each, um, typically when these instruments are flown, they're flown for a particular project. And so the data look very different than satellite data where typically you get 
you know, complete or near complete coverage of an area. Uh, so often it's just those fairly narrow flight lines that we saw in many of the slides earlier where the, the, the aircraft are going to a particular place where often there's a field team on the ground. And so they're, you know, in some ways less generally useful than satellite observations because they're, they're typically very focused on a particular place with a particular, you know, group of scientists asking a particular question. Um, but the, the individual sites that you saw, for example, if you go to the Avers NG site, um, of which I can add the link in a moment, you can pull up a map and see exactly where it's been and, and get access to those data. So you probably have to do it instrument by instrument to see if, if a particular instrument has been in that area. But I'll just add briefly that um, I think NASA has done an incredible job here at pioneering this idea of open data. So even though this, th these observations are very expensive to collect, um, they're, they're typically available soon after the mission on the website to anybody with a, a computer and internet access. All right, great. Thank you, Adam. Okay, so moving on to question seven, will Bioscape also be able to identify and map invasive plants in the landscape? Um, any panelists uh, who either answer that question, please feel free to introduce yourself and explain some more here or if anyone else would like to add to this answer. I can take I can take that one again. This is Adam Wilson again. Um, yes, we, we do anticipate that uh, in particular Avers NG will likely be very useful for uh, identifying invasive plants that in both well on both land and and in water um, that are like dense stands. You know, so the spatial resolution of the Bioscape project is going to be about five meter. And so, you know, it's not going to be able to pick up some tiny, tiny little plant that's in the understory. But if it's a, a, a significant stand, um, a significant density of that particular species, then yes, we do expect to do that. But again, this is this is the this is the cutting edge, right? This we haven't actually done it yet. So um, I anticipate that we will, um, but it it hasn't been done yet in this system. All right, great. Thank you, Adam. I think we're certainly looking forward to, to seeing the results. All right, so on to question eight. With regards to the Bioscape campaign, how do the animal surveys tie into the airborne data? Is it expected that the sensors will pick something up with regards to animal diversity slash abundance, or are they just an additional resource to better understand the ecosystem dynamics? I can take that one as well. Um, I, I put the answers there, but I think there are there are a few different ways that this can be done. Um, one is to think of the remote sensing data as being able to measure and distinguish different kinds of habitat in in much sort of finer resolution, finer spectral resolution, which translates to finer um, kind of ecosystem resolution that would enable us to characterize habitats across space. So, for example, having the the Elvis LIDAR data gives us some idea of the, the three-dimensional structure. So canopy height, how tall are the shrubs, are there trees, that sort of thing. And then the, uh, the spectrometers are capturing variation in uh, functional traits of the canopy itself. And I'm, I'm speaking here mostly about the, uh, the terrestrial systems. So you could think of it as a habitat mapper in a way that could be combined with the field observations of bird distributions or um anything any you know mammals whatever you're interested in um so that's that's one potential way another way is to um look kind of more uh phenomenologically at, at the relationship so for example if you um remember i mentioned in the presentation this idea of soundscapes so having autonomous microphones that are recording sounds those sounds can actually be um transformed into measures of of acoustic diversity so if you have many different species that have, includes you know frogs that are croaking at low frequencies and birds that are tweeting at high frequencies and lots of different variations that would be a site that had more acoustic diversity and then another site you know maybe is is quiet or maybe there's just you know one kind of frog that's that's croaking at one frequency that would be a lower acoustic diversity site and then we could compare those even without knowing what the species are, just purely on that acoustic, uh, on those acoustic terms, we could compare those 
with the uh, observed spectral diversity of those sites. And so a working hypothesis there is that a site that has more spectral diversity probably harbors more animal diversity um, just because there's more variation in habitat, different kinds of species, different you know, structural variation that may favor um, you know, supporting different, different kinds of, of species across taxonomic groups that could be measured in um, either on with direct observations or with something like the, the Soundscapes project. All right, great, thank you. So for question nine, uh, for the Bioscape project, how is the classification schema decided upon? Are there hopes to map biodiversity at a finer scale, uh, increase the number of classes, for example? If so, what are some challenges the presenter sees in accomplishing finer scale mapping of biodiversity? So it seems like there's a couple different responses here. Um, who's ever answering them, I certainly encourage you to, to go ahead and unmute. Um, Adam, I think I see you unmuted, so if you'd like to answer that, please go ahead. Sure, I can take a stab at it. Um, yeah, so, so this idea of classifications is interesting, and certainly um, it's a, a very classic remote sensing technique is this idea of being able to identify and separate out you know, forest from shrubland, from you know, uh, wetland, or, or whatever your categories are. And I think you could use these data to develop a, a more uh, finer scale classification as this question suggests. Um, however, we're not really taking that approach. And I don't think anyone, as it says below, I don't think um, any of the teams is really thinking about this as a classification exercise. Instead, we're thinking more in, in like continuous space. So instead of putting pixels into categories, we're trying to measure things like uh, what is the community level um, leaf specific area? So like the, 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 the thickness of leaves or what is the, um, um, you know, what is the three dimensional structure of a pixel in continuous, in continuous space, right? So, so not actually um, putting things into categories, but instead measuring attributes of those ecosystems that we think are important, trying to measure or estimate those things directly. Um, so that we'll actually have maps of functional traits, maps of leaf phenolics, maps of phytoplankton functional um, group mixtures in a particular pixels. So certainly this classification could be done and it'd be interesting to do that. It would be interesting to compare it with existing uh, vegetation maps across the region because um, the, the traditional way of, of developing ecosystem types is, involves a lot of field work. Um, and, and, and putting, you know, visiting a place and putting that, looking at which species are there and putting those into categories that then you could put on, the map, on a map that would be useful for making management decisions. But if we could figure out how to do that more effectively using remote sensing, then that opens the door to uh, ongoing monitoring of change, right? So we can actually compare week to week, month to month, year to year, um, how are these things changing, which might be useful to, to better target um, you know, limited field field dollars, right? Field work is always expensive. Um, it's extremely important, as I as I mentioned above. But I think the putting those two things together, the remote sensing based approach and the the field surveys, is really is really critical. Hi, this is Leanne Gild from NASA Ames Research Center in California, and I just wanted to add just a little bit more because I I wasn't sure if I had a different interpretation of this question. But we're also dealing with a uh, diversity of spectral, spatial, but we're not able to get at temporal scale. So in terms of classification, we could be looking at this in, in, in relation to spectral um, diversity and being able to delineate finer features. So it's not clear what is meant by um, fine scale, uh, finer scale um, biodiversity. Um, in classification. Um, also, with spatial scale, at the altitudes that we will be flying, we do have limitations of about, um, I think that was presented earlier, um, different spatial scales that are um, opportunities. And some of the teams have asked for higher spatial resolution. So if we're able to um, get that, attain that in the campaign, 
that's going to be fun, a fun um, outcome in terms of looking at the ability to get at finer resolution and delineate some of these differences, say, for example, in the aquatic realm, being able to delineate invasive and um, native uh, species. So um, stay tuned. These are really exciting questions and something that we will be looking at. But also for data available to the science community, it's something that uh, could be explored as well for those interested. All right, great. Thank you both. Okay, so moving on to question 10. Uh, does LIDAR data resolution vary? Uh, so it looks like the answer is yes. Uh, whoever added that response, I certainly encourage you to, to let us know what your answer was, or else I can just read it off here. All right, well, the, uh, the uh, person wrote down that the resolution of any airborne instrument depends on the altitude the plane flies at, closer to the ground, meaning a finer resolution for your data. And in the case of Elvis, this also varies further depending on which lens is fitted, although altitude remains the main driver of resolution. And Brittany, I'll just add to that. Um, so that in, ne in next week in this class, one of the guest speakers is going to talk about an, um, terrestrial LIDAR scanning as well, which is when you essentially bring a LIDAR down to the ground and, and spin it around. And you can use the same technique to build a three-dimensional model of whatever's around you. This is used extensively in, in like civil engineering and construction, um, but also in ecology to capture the three-dimensional structure uh, of of an ecosystem at extremely high resolution, like millimeter and even sub millimeter scale uh, characterizations of of an ecosystem, and you'll see some animations and information about that next week. Um, Brittany, can I add one more thing to that? This is Erin Hester. I am a professor of civil and environmental engineering at UC Merced, and am uh, one of the the aquatic leads for the Bioscape campaign. One of the things that's really important to consider when we talk about uh, resolution of airborne campaigns is that there's always a trade-off between the altitude that you fly and your coverage spatially. So if you fly closer to the ground, you get smaller pixels and higher spatial resolution, but it also means that you can cover a smaller area in your study region. So for any airborne campaign, there's always a scientific trade-off between the spatial coverage and the spatial resolution. And that's what your final decision is, is gonna depend on what the science is that you're trying to achieve. All right, great. Thank you both uh, for that information. On to question 11. Uh, when analyzing dense forests with multi-layered LIDAR, do you consider differences in the beam with respect to other open canopies or open vegetation so that it can penetrate the ground and be measurable? Looks like there might be some confusion around this answer. I don't know uh, if any of the panelists want to provide a response right now or if we can gather one and provide it when we post the questions on the website later. Okay, uh, for the sake of time, we can move on to question 12. Uh, what is the best way to get involved in projects like Bioscape? I think I see someone unmuted if they'd like to answer the question. Uh, this is the, yeah, I, I can answer that. This is Jasper Slingsby uh, from University, University of Cape Town. Um, yeah, essentially best to go to our website and have a look at the, find out more about the project. So that's uh, www.bioscape.io um, and you, you can find out a lot more about each of the individual projects under the science tab. You can find out a lot about the team under the team tab. Um, and then if you want to reach out to us, please do. You can either reach out directly to the teams 
Um, I was just looking at the website because we literally just revamped it yesterday or the day before, um, and I'm not finding the contact us item anymore, so we'll have to have a quick look and add that in. Um, but other than that, all the bias, all the data collected will be made freely available of the campaign, so anyone is welcome to use it. That's certainly the case, at least for all the um, uh, re remotely sensed data, for the individual team data, that might vary to some degree. Thanks. All right, great. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Jasper. Uh, on to question 13 then. Can you please speak about post-fire vegetation recovery studies that will be done in Bioscape? Um, I can probably speak to this as well. Um, essentially, uh, the focus isn't necessarily on post-fire vegetation recovery. Um, and this is a one-source set of flights. So we're, we're only really going to be able to look at the influence of fire in a space for time substitution framework. Um, but the issue is just that fire and post-fire recovery dynamics are is incredibly important in this ecosystem for almost any form of biodiversity. So it's something we can't ignore um, and something that, that each of the teams is going to have to take into account. So I have put some references here for some of our research and how we look at post-fire recovery from, in a remote sensing framework. Um, but there's plenty more um, work on fire dynamics and post-fire vegetation recovery in, 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 uh, the, in the Bioscape um, area. Uh, I hope that covers it. All right, wonderful. Uh, on to question 14. Given that SAR is increasingly being used to model biomass, are there any RSET webinars planned for using uh, airborne, uninhabited aerial, aerial uh, vehicle SAR? That is a uh, great question. Um, we're always looking for different webinars and training projects to do in the future. I don't know off the hop top of my head if that is one that's planned, but that's something that we can look into and consider for the future. Okay, question 15. Typically, how powerful are the LIDAR lasers? Would anyone be comfortable answering that question? Um, Brittany, I can take a stab at that. Um, so the laser transmitter for Elvis uh, is at, again, that near-infrared wavelength of 1,064 nanometers. Um, and it's a, um, it produces uh, signals every 10 nanoseconds at 5 millijoule pulses. And it does that at a repetition rate of 500 hertz. Great, thank you, Erin. Okay, so for question 16, will the eDNA data collected in aquatic ecosystems in the Cape lead to contributions to the DNA database for aquatic organisms such as river invertebrate in South Africa? Looks like someone responded, so I certainly encourage you to unmute if you'd like. Um, hi, this is Annabelle Cardo. So I'm the Bioscape Science Team Manager. Um, so yes, uh, as has been mentioned, um, all NASA funded research follows an open science framework. Um, so all of the data collected during the campaign will be made publicly available. And we would love to be able to incorporate this into existing data repositories within South Africa. Um, we do have to double check the scope of how much work this specific team is doing on barcoding of freshwater invertebrates, um, because they have quite a broad range of organisms that they're looking at. 
but um, to the extent that they are barcoding freshwater invertebrates, yes. Thanks, Brittany. Yeah, I, uh, sorry, this is Jasper. I, I just add to that. I think it's not likely that they're going to be collecting lots of specimens to build their own library. So what would happen is they would end up with uh, DNA fragments that they could say, you know, is from some or other order of invertebrate from the stream um, and essentially be able to identify that there are species present that aren't in existing DNA libraries. Um, but I don't know to what extent they'll actually be building their own libraries. Um, that said, I haven't spoken to the team, um, but I'd imagine that that would be a bigger undertaking than they're planning at this stage. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so for question 17, uh, is there any data to compare the previous and recent data in Europe, especially from the area of Turkey, aiming to compare the differentiations after the 7.4 and 7.6 devastating earthquakes? Great question. I think that's similar to a couple of the other questions we've had about when and where different airborne campaigns have taken place. Um, I think Adam did a great explanation of how this is different from satellites where they're just you know, continuous coverage and that these different airborne campaigns are based on missions at that time. So uh, you might be able to find uh, data from different airborne campaigns before and after the earthquake, but it's not going to be on a continuous basis. So that's something that you'll have to look into with different airborne uh, campaigns and where you retrieve the data from. I don't know if anyone has anything they'd like to add. I'll add real briefly, if you're interested in, in changes in the like physical structure of, of a place, so for example, if a building was impacted, that's something that uh, Spaceborne SAR, the, the radar type tool, might actually be useful. So I, I don't know if anybody's looking at that. It wouldn't surprise me if they were. But for example, the Sentinel-1 uh, satellite that the European Space Agency has um, might be able to detect, you know, the, the sort of physical structural changes. So, for example, if a building collapsed, um, it's possible that you'd be able to see that using a, a SAR type instrument. All right, great, thank you. And it looks like NASA is also using satellite data to assess the damage, and we have a link there for anyone who's interested in looking at that as well. Okay, so question 18. Could you go into more detail regarding the bio soundscapes and the independent autonomous recording units designed to sample sites across land cover types? Um, yeah, hi, this is Annabelle again. I can speak a little bit about this. So um, there are little recording boxes that the team is going to be strapping to trees in various locations and they'll leave them out for a couple of weeks and then go and collect them and then listen to the recordings to see if they can pick out specific bird and frog calls. And eventually the idea is that with enough training data, hopefully this process can be automated. Um, so that you can use machine learning to classify these recordings. Um, and in terms of sampling across land cover types, so this project is, um, uh, yes, they're called audio maths, these recorders. I see someone is updating the notes. Um, uh, this project is specifically interested in how distance from anthropogenic features and water features influences uh, bird and frog calls. So, for example, like is how close you are to a road affecting how many um, frogs or birds are in an area? I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, question 19. How is Bioscape funded? Is it co-funded by USA NASA and South African parties? Suppose there's interest in planning and running a similar campaign in a different biodiversity spot anywhere else. Could you provide a piece of advice on how to approach such collaboration? 
whoever answered that question, I encourage you to unmute if you can. I can take that one. Someone else wrote most of that, but um, so yes, uh, Bioscape is co-funded by NASA and the South African Space Agency, SANSA. Um, it, it came about because uh, Woody Turner at the Biological Diversity Program at NASA um, put out a call, a request for proposals related to building a biodiversity field campaign. So it essentially, the idea for, for Bioscape in general, not, not specific to, um, to this region, but just in general, um, was came out of, of the Biological Diversity Program Office and Woody Turner at, at NASA. And so he had the idea, essentially, that wouldn't this be a great idea to get a bunch of people together to um, ask some of these important questions about measuring and monitoring biodiversity and how we can use these new tools to do it more effectively. And so several teams competed for that uh, and Bioscape was, was selected. So that's how Bioscape came to be. And then in the process of developing the idea, um, we reached out to collaborators um, in, in South Africa and also the South African Space Agency, and they were excited to um, be a participant and, and co-fund much of this research. And in terms of reaching out or looking for new opportunities, I see the EPSCOR um, program. That's a, that's a great thing to check. Um, also, keep your eye, you know, eyes open on um, NASA funding opportunities through ROSES. So if you're interested in this kind of project, um, adding yourself to the, the ROSES email list or checking the NASA ROSES um, website, that's where this kind of uh, opportunities are announced. Yeah, I suppose probably worth adding just that, uh, you know, NASA and NSF can't fund people outside the U.S. So if the question comes from somebody outside the U.S., then, you know, it's all about building networks, I suppose, and collaborating with people inside the U.S. and then also trying to uh, lobby your local funding agency to kind of get excited and interested in the program. Fortunately, in our case, we managed to... Um, get the South African National Space Agency excited about Bioscape as well, and they put up a put out a funding call um, that has been allowed us to, um, well, has allowed there to be funding for um, South African scientists that don't have to be necessarily associated with the NASA grants. All right, great, thank you both. Uh, Can I add so one, for the one? Sake oh, absolutely. Oh, sorry. sorry to interrupt you. Um, I do yep. want to highlight, building on what Jasper said, um, one of the, the big challenges in a campaign like this, and I, I alluded to this in my presentation when I mentioned parachute science, is this kind of project is, is typically very expensive. You know, these instruments are very expensive. The airplanes are very expensive. All, you know, everything about the, the technology side is expensive, um, which means that many um, countries are not, you know, they don't have the research budgets that that the U.S. has and that NASA has. Um, and so one of the, the sort of risks of a project like this is that it's dominated by people from those wealthier countries that, that sort of go to a place, collect their data, and then go home. Um, and so that's why we've been so conscious from the very beginning at, at seeking out the, um, the, the funding from the South African Space Agency and working hard to get those, those funding calls in place so that we could have a, a science team that I'm happy to say is about half and half between the U.S. and South Africa, uh, the participants that are involved in it. Um, and I, I think that's a really important aspect of this, in particular when studying something like biodiversity, right? Because the, the you know, the ecosystems around us are, um, it's our home, right? So like we're, you know, the, the U.S. planes are going to South Africa and flying around a place that, that obviously people are living. It's their, it's, it's their home, it's their surroundings, it's their um it's their landscapes and so i think that having that local connection is is not just important but it's it's like critical like the, this project would not work without that close partnership and the, the expert opinion of of all of the south african scientists that are involved in the project um and i, I see this as a real opportunity for building scientific community, um, building collaborative relationships between, in this case, it's South Africa and the US, but you know, more, more broadly just around um, doing what we can with the tools that we have to better uh, appreciate, understand, manage, and conserve biodiversity.
Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I think on that note, that is uh, the amount of time we have for this training today. So this does mark the end of session three for our biodiversity applications for airborne imaging systems training. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you all for uh, oh, sorry, session three on Monday, April 3rd at 11 a.m. Eastern, uh, where we will hear from Atticus Duvall and Phil Townsend about using airborne data for terrestrial biodiversity research. Uh, have a great day, and thank you again for being a part of this session. <laughs>